But are you ready? Let us begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you as always for the ability to gather together around your holy word. We ask that you continue to bless our time together as we study uh, both the Gospel of Luke and his follow-on uh, of the book of Acts. Uh, I ask especially today as we hopefully finish talking about uh, John the Baptist and his preparation for your son's ministry, uh, that you give us greater insight into the wonderful plan of salvation that you had, as we heard this morning, from the foundations of the earth. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so I'll kind of get us a little bit caught up to where we were. So we are still, for the 12, 13, 14, fourth week in a row, we're still in John chapter 3, uh, and the, the sheets haven't changed. So if you have a sheet that says lesson 12 and 13 at the top, we're really on lesson 14, or 15, I mean, out of lesson 12 and 13, but we're still on those sheets. Um, and so what we were looking at the last time, which was not, remember last week, we couldn't meet due to our voters meeting. And I think the week before that, we got snowed out. So it's actually been three weeks since we've been able to, to actually meet together. Um, but we had started looking at uh, John and calling the, um, the crowds that came out to meet him a brood of vipers. We talked about how there's a connection there between the viper, the snake who causes people to fall. Uh, the serpent. Um, we talked about uh, the um, John's saying of uh, that God can raise up children of Abraham out of rocks and what that meant. Um, and so we had we had really kind of talked a lot about what John was was uh, trying to get across here. Uh, we talked about God's judgment and His wrath. Uh, we talked about the Greek word for, for fire. Yeah. Do you mean Luke? Luke, yeah, that's what I mean. Um, oh, I'm talking about John the Baptist. <laughs> so when, when, I says, when I say when John says, I'm meaning that these are literally the words of John the Baptist in the Gospel of Luke. Sorry for the confusion. Yes, we are still in Luke's Gospel. It gets a little... John is not that original of a name at biblical times. Uh, first JB. Yes, yeah, JB. When JB <laughs> speaks, this is what he says. Um, so yes, that, that, is, that is why I was saying John, not to confuse with the gospel writer, um, who I don't think actually has this, <laughs> this narrative. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and so then we continued on. Towards, I think we started, we kind of wrapped up on number 13 on our sheets. The people ask, what then shall we do? Right? And this is uh, this question of what then shall we do? This is in verse 10 of chapter 3. Is a, a very pointed question, right? Uh, and it's a very common question, I think, that uh, when, we are, when we are told that we're doing something wrong or screwing something up, it's very common for us to say, well, well what, what am I supposed to do then, right? Uh, and in most human things, it's not a bad question. I'm doing this wrong behavior. I want to do good behavior. What am I supposed to do for the good behavior? Where it gets us in trouble is when we actually start talking about theology and the standing before God, right? We, we do something wrong, and we think that because we, on our own sinfulness, are the ones that messed it up, that we should be the ones that fix it. Two. Uh, hi, buddy. Did you just say chocolate? I want coffee. Oh, you want coffee? I want coffee, too. You know what would be really great? If you hadn't broken our coffee pot two days ago, son, then we could have coffee. But this is why we can't have nice things. And he lacks the ability to fix the coffee pot, right? So focusing on things that we do, he did the wrong thing by taking our coffee pot and smashing it into our sink. Uh, and... Uh, doesn't have the capacity or ability to fix that problem, much like us in our standing with God. We take this beautiful thing that he gives us, this beautiful world, this beautiful relationship with him, and like my son, we smash it right into the sink. And we, also like my one-year-old, hi, I love you so much, don't have the ability to fix it again. This is why the question of what then shall we do is really a bad question when it comes to our salvation. 
If you pay attention, this is the same question that the crowd gives in the book of Acts after Peter gives that glorious sermon where 3,000 people come to faith. What do they ask? What then shall we do? <laughs> right? And what does Peter say? Well, in a nutshell, it's loving your neighbor. What was that? In a nutshell, it's loving your neighbor. In a nutshell, it's loving your neighbor. But there's something before that that leads to the loving of the neighbor. Are you in Acts or are you in Luke? Well, I'm in Luke. Okay, I'm asking in Acts. Acts. Acts, I think also like chapter 3. Mm -hmm. It might be 2. Is it at Pentecost? It is, yeah. It would be chapter 3. Okay. Acts. I'll tell you in a, give me one second, and I'll tell you. 2 is, two is St. Peter's, um, Saint, Saint Peter's sermon. Right there, here we go. Uh, chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciple or the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. This is the bringing together of the two baptisms. If you remember back, we talked about the difference between John's baptism of repentance and forgiveness and Christ's baptism, which actually makes us sons, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Um, and so you have together the bringing of both of these. I guess he, he Repent. Peter. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, but even, even JB is saying repent, right? There's a, re a repentance here. How do you stop being the brood of vipers? You repent. You repent and you come to Christ. Um, and, and John the Baptist is the one that leads to Christ. Um, and, and, in, and in Luke, where Mark was going, and now we're introducing a third apostle, or a third gospel writer, right? In Luke, where Mark <laughs> was telling us about what John the Baptist was saying, John the Baptist gives these, and Mark summed it up well with this kind of loving neighbor, but what this does is this gets rid of earthly attachments, right? So we, we see here, they ask, well, what then shall we do? And he, he says, whoever has two tunics, share with him who has none. Whoever has food, do likewise. Tax, tax collectors also came and said, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you're authorized. Soldiers asked him, What shall we do? Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, but be content with your wages. So all of these things deal with a, a detachment from worldly things. All right? Hi, son. Worrying too much about the clothes that you wear. Worrying too much about the food that you're going to eat. Worrying too much about your money. All of these are, are worldly attachments that can get in the way of God and, and not necessarily bring us closer to God. And so this is what John is doing. And this is that preparation. Uh, at the time when, um, when monastic orders, monks, kind of came into, uh, into use, um, this, this was why they removed themselves from the world. Right? This started as a very good thing. I want, to, I want to cut off attachments, so I will take a vow of, of poverty, a vow of chastity, and I will cut myself off from these worldly attachments. The difficulty becomes, when we turn that into the new law, that by doing so, I bring, I bring myself closer to God. Um, there's certainly a place for cutting yourself off from worldly attachments. Today is an appropriate day to talk about the place of those things. We're getting ready to enter into Lent. What do people normally do during Lent? Give up something, right? It's usually something trivial. I'm not going to eat chocolate, all right? I'm not going to eat chocolate. I'm not going to eat chocolate, right? Um, just a little bit of pain, right? Uh, I'm just not going to eat chocolate or sweets in general. I'll give up caffeine. Can't do that one either. Can I? Those types of things, right? Um, but this uh, this concept of giving something up is good. Um, a lot of people will use Lent as a, con or a time to give something up that they know is detrimental for them, but they otherwise haven't, haven't been able to give up, right? So um, this might seem a little crass, and I don't mean it to, but I know of, of guys or gals that have struggled with pornography and said, for Lent, I'm going to make a deliberate effort to give this up, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it so that when I feel that tug to do something that I shouldn't, then... I will be reminded of, of Christ's temptation and what he endured for me, and I'll use it as a time of prayer. Um, this is originally what fasting was, right? You, you, you give up something that you need temporarily 
And then you feel those hunger pains. And that is, that is supposed to drive you back to your human weakness and the, the almighty power of God. For what did we learn last week, right? God's strength is made perfect in our weaknesses, right? Um, Does God tell us to, uh, to fast? Yeah, or to get, or, or, you know, to Certainly, get, fasting is interwoven throughout the entirety of Scripture as being good and useful. Of self-discipline. It is, yeah. Well, and this is why why St. Paul says we discipline our bodies, right? right? This is part of that bodily discipline. Fasting is good. Periods of fasting are good. Can you take it to excess? Yes. Some say that Martin Luther dealt with digestive issues the entirety of his adult life because of how crazy he fasted early as a monk because he dealt with all of this guilt and so he would he would fast to try to discipline his body uh, as a way of paying off their sins yes than yeah their yeah and what we should what we should use and the, the entire concept of giving up anything for lent is um is to bring you closer to god right so that even the concept of fasting is i i feel that hunger i give up food so that i feel the hunger and then I remind my body that God is in control. I am not in control. And, and I go to him in prayer. I go to him in devotion when I feel those hunger pains. What does this do? This, this teaches us that when, just because we feel an impulse does not mean we have to give in to the impulse. So if you struggle in other aspects of your life, one easy thing to start is fasting. And that gives you this, this idea of I'm using God's word to control these things. <laughs> How many, how many keychains do you need there, kid? All of them. Yeah, all of the keychains. <laughs> uh, it's how he plays with his toys, too. Yeah. <laughs> I want all the toys. But this is what we use those things for, and that's good, and that's right. The, where we turn it into a law is when we, we force ourselves into we have to do this to merit something in the eyes of God, right? And this, this is where what, what started as great and good practices have, have changed over time. Um, this is where in, this, in the Psalms, um, or even in Isaiah, he'll talk about sacrifices no longer being pleasing to God, the aromas of burnt offerings no longer being pleasing, because the, the reasoning has changed to a human reasoning. I'm doing this to merit this, and my actions are what does this. Um, or, or in the case of Israel, a lot of times, I'm doing these actions, and yet my, my behavior doesn't, doesn't reflect. I don't make any... I, I go and I do the sin, I come back, I offer the, the burnt offering, okay, now I'm good, and now I go out and I can live whatever way I want to so that I can come back, offer the burnt offering, and you get caught in this cycle, this cyclical you know, kind of nature of it doesn't actually attempt to change you in any meaningful way. Um, now we have to be careful with that too, right? Uh, to where if, if we want to say, well, are, 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 the, fruits, are the fruits of my... My good standing before God, my forgiveness, are acts of love and a desire to amend life. But if I don't love people like I should and I don't mend life, is my, what, what we would call justification, is my standing before God ruined? Well, not necessarily, right? So you have to be, you have to be very careful of these things. Uh, if you push justification to the detriment of sanctification so hard, then all that matters is your standing before God, and that never translates into any meaningful change in life. But if you, prove, if you push sanctification so hard, I have to see the fruits of this justification, and you focus so much on the works that you're doing, you might lose the fact that Christ is the one that makes us good before God, and it's not our works. So these things always have to hold each other in tension. Good theology is theology that always is held in tension with what we would kind of see as, um, hi, son, you want to come sit with me? Um, what we kind of see as these um, almost paradoxes, uh, but they hold, they hold the faith in, in, in tension, and, and that's, that's good for us to do. Um, all right, moving on to 14. The atmosphere of messianic expectation that we talk, talked about with Simeon and Anna uh, is also evident here. In verse thir- or 15, sorry, 15, we get the words, uh, As the people were in expectation... And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. So this, this expectation, uh, remember when we talked about Simeon, Simeon was promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so Simeon was waiting in, that, in, that, in expectation. Same thing with Anna. Anna in the temple night and day, right? And if you, if you ever thought about this and you did, did the math, Anna married young, 
She lived with her husband for seven years from the time they were married. Then her husband died, and she was a widow from probably early 30s all the way to where she's in her 80s. And she is, and yet during that entire time, she is in God's house night and day, praying and praising. Wow, incredible faith. Right? Was that? Would you she did go home to eat, right? I hope so. I hope so. Um, uh, I, I would imagine that there was probably some eating that occurred. That's a long time to fast. That, that might have detrimental effects on the body. Um, and, and yet, we, you know, we, we, we see this faith of Anna. But she was there because she was expecting something, right? The people are in expectations. Um, as, as the time of Jesus drew near, there was almost a heightened expectation, especially as John comes. And this is why John was kind of mistaken for the Christ because they were looking for certain signs and John was doing some of them. Um, he was one like Elijah and, and they knew from, from their own messianic prophecies that one like Elijah would, would come or Elijah would come back before the Christ would come and that's what John is reminding them of um, that, that he's not the one, he's the one preparing the way for God. Um, so people like that, like Anna, yeah, um, do you think they were most influenced by Isaiah then? There are probably a lot of Isaiah, probably a lot of Daniel. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, good messianic prophecies in almost all of the prophets. Um, and that, but that's also the tricky thing about prophecy. If you remember from our, I can't remember, were you in the Isaiah class? No. Okay. So in our Isaiah class, we talked a lot about uh, different levels of prophecy and how prophecy can get very tricky because some things are fulfilled at the time of the prophet. Some things are fulfilled in the life of Israel after the prophet. And then some things are never fully fulfilled in Christ. But even things that are happen at the life of the prophet and maybe even after come to their, their truest fruition in the person of Christ. And so this gets very difficult when you're trying to, to, to set these things aside and say, well, this, this is attributed to this, this is attributed to this, and how does that... How does that work? Um, uh, prophecy is, is one of those things that uh, you know, gets proved, and this is how the ancients looked at prophecy. It, it's proven true or false in whether it comes true or not. Right? So how do we know if this person was a false prophet? Well, none of the stuff that they said came true. Well, what does that do for the generations that happened between Isaiah, because he lived about 700 years before Christ, right? Between Isaiah and when Jesus came. Right? So those things get pretty tricky sometimes. Um, so they're, they're asking John, the Baptist, not the gospel writer, uh, if he is the Christ. And what, is, what does John reply in verse 16? What does John do? Yeah. Yeah, John points not to himself, but John points to the, the power of the one that comes after, right? The, the thongs of whose sandals he's not worthy to untie. Um, this and other Gospels, we, we know that this fits John, where he will say, I must decrease so that he can increase, right? John, once the Christ comes, John takes the back seat. There's no more time of preparation. The time of preparation is over. Christ is there. Um, and that, that's important for us also uh, to realize. Um, there may be also a kind of reminder that in the mention of a sandal, uh, back in, in the Old Testament in Ruth chapter 4, where Boaz redeems Ruth. Um, Elimelech uh, is the closest relative to Naomi. Uh, and if you remember, Naomi was, was sold into slavery and, not, uh, and this, this um, relative wouldn't buy her back. Boaz then was next in line, and he is the one that bought back Naomi. And when Elimelech passed his sandal to Boaz, he was saying publicly he renounced his property rights and was giving them to Boaz. And so this, this concept of the sandal being passed to show certain rights being passed uh, is also symbolic. Uh, when, he's saying, when John is saying that he's not worthy to untie Jesus' sandal, he's saying that, that he, John, cannot buy back what has been sold into slavery, namely Israel right? Uh, through their sins have, been, have sold themselves into slavery, and John is not the Christ, not the one that is there to buy back the people. Uh, another term, does anybody know the 
kind of theological term that means to buy back? Starts with an R. Redeemed. Redeemed. To redeem someone is to buy them back. Think about it. If you redeem a coupon, what do you do? You take it in and you get you get what the coupon says, right? Um, and in this connotation, Christ is. That's why he's called the Redeemer. He's the one that has, as the Catechism said, purchased and won us, right? Not with gold or silver, but with his holy innocent blood, right? Um, and so there's this con- this this concept of the sandal being the authority to to buy back. Now I don't know the background behind that. I have never seen in scripture anywhere other than Ruth uh, chapter 4 where it talks about this um, and being used this way. Um, but the, the, the um, and faith does come out when Jesus sends the disciples out uh, and they come to a town that won't receive them. They're told to do what? Shake the dust off their, Shake the dust off their sandals, right? So the sandal as, as this authority... Um, not leaving anything, not taking anything out and away from that town because they've rejected the gospel, the authority. Uh, this I, I've never heard it. I'm, I'm totally theolo- theologizing out loud, so this may be semi-heretical. I haven't thought it through. But is there a concept then of, of the disciples being almost like the office of the keys where sin is bound in the rejection of the gospel and the shaking off of the sandal as a representative of the authority to to bind that sin, to take nothing away from that town who has rejected the gospel that the disciples have. Anything in any uh, uh, commentary? Really heretical in some. The office of the keys certainly isn't heretical. Or they just didn't think it through like that. Oh, or they didn't think it through like that. But that's the beauty of God's word, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, number 16. John continues, John continues to speak in 3.16, not John 3.16, Luke 3.16, to say he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Um, when does Jesus baptize with the Spirit and fire? Uh, there is no record uh, in any of the Gospels of Jesus performing any baptisms. In fact, we are told explicitly, is it in John's gospel, that Jesus certainly performed no baptisms. Um, Jesus didn't baptize anyone. Except for the Holy Spirit to come upon the, yeah. the apostles with tongues of fire. And- yeah, there we go. Now we're talking. That baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire after Jesus' ascension, which ironically enough is told in what book? Acts, right? That Luke also wrote. So this concept that Luke, Luke is weaving, Jesus' baptism, um, is, is really there. Um, so there's no record of Jesus performing any baptisms. Uh, baptism, spirit, and fire, two of these three elements are found together at Jesus' baptism, uh, where you have Jesus' baptism and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Are you going to make a mess of all of those, man? No. No? Okay. That's good to know. Um, uh and then in chapter 12, and also at Pentecost, you have all of these. Uh, at uh, chapter 12, verses 49 through 50, fire and baptism are mentioned. The fire that Jesus speaks of is God's wrath. Uh, thanks. I appreciate those. Oh, you want to sit on my lap and eat your goldfish. Okay. So you can crunch in the ear of all of our friends at home. Uh, ch- chapter 12, fire and baptism mentioned, where fire is God's wrath which rightfully would consume the world, and yet uh, Jesus, standing in humanity's place, absorbs this fire of God's wrath in his baptism on the cross. Um, And then three on Pentecost in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes and tongues of fire rest on the apostles. Thus, by these three things, by Pentecost, uh, by the time of Pentecost, Jesus had been baptized with the Holy Spirit at his baptism, baptized by fire at his crucifixion, And then the post-Pentecost baptizing, Jesus gives uh, the spirit and fire, um, thereby uniting uh, those baptized with his life, death, and resurrection. Therein, Jesus' baptism becomes our baptism. His death becomes our death. His life becomes our life. And thus, those baptized into Christ are baptized with the spirit and fire, which he was baptized with. And, uh, and this, is, this is why St. Paul will say, don't you know that those of us who have been baptized have been united with him in his death? And if we've been united with him in a death like his, 
we shall also be united with him in a life like his. So all of that comes together. Sure. Uh, when he healed the ten, I believe, on the road of leprosy. Yep. And the one comes back who's a Samaritan. Yep. Him praise. And I think he says, uh, go your faith has healed you. Yep. Now, the Samaritan probably wasn't baptized, right? Probably not. Is that um, considered a baptism then? So, it, it, yeah, it certainly could be. Um, the... I mean, if you think about it, what, what Jesus was telling the Samaritan to do was a type of baptism. Because the, the, the Greek word that we get baptized from, baptizo, simply means I wash. Uh, and so the, in, in that exact narrative, Jesus tells the lepers to go to the priest to have the ritual washing done, the baptism done. And so I would imagine that if the Samaritan wanted to rejoin any of his family, he still, even after Jesus said, go your way, your faith has healed you, he still would have went to the priest, been, been washed. Now, is that Jesus, a, a Christian baptism? I don't know. Um, the fact that Jesus himself forgave sins, uh, and, and that's what we, you know, we receive forgiveness, life, and salvation in baptism, you could probably make an argument uh, that it, it was a type of baptism at least. And, um, I don't know if I would say that it is fully a Christian baptism because, uh, well, I don't know. What do you think, kid? Was that a baptism? No? Are you going to be shy? Okay. Yeah, I don't know, Mark. I'd have to think about that a little bit more because, um, you know, he's certainly not baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the Son is literally standing there who's already received the Spirit and the blessing of the Father. Uh, and is the substance of God, um, right? He didn't certainly use water and, and wash him, but commanded him to go to the priest. Um, and so th this is why m a lot of times in that narrative, pastors will use the symbolic um, leprosy of sin, baptism washes away, you know, this is what that w the water signifies. Um, and so there, there's probably something there. To, to talk about the two at least. I don't know if, once again, if I'd go so far as to say it was unequivocally a Christian baptism, but I don't know. You can ask Jesus when you get there. He'll have a better answer than me. Uh, number 17. John's exhortation and preaching of the good news was a call to repentance. Repentance then led to the forgiveness of sins. In Acts on the day of Pentecost, people told the people, uh, Peter told the people that they had crucified the Christ. The people were cut to the heart and, as we talked about before, asked, what shall we do? And Peter's response was, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So like I said earlier, the message of both John and Peter was the same, and it was the good news because it led to forgiveness of sins. Now, the baptisms aren't the same, but the message is, right? John the Baptist points to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus points to himself. Um, and, and this, because he's the one that forgives sins. Hi. Uh, as Luke has paralleled the birth, circumcision, and naming of John and Jesus, so now he parallels their baptisms and their violent rejections. This is called step parallelism. If you remember, we talked about that before. Uh, with Jesus always being the greater of the two. John's ministry comes to an abrupt halt with his imprisonment and death, which confirms his prophetic office with John's death comes the end of the old era. Uh, with Jesus' baptism, a new era begins. In Luke, there is no reference to John and Jesus' baptism. There was a clean break between the old and the new eras. And so I always kind of found that interesting, right? We, we hear in, in Luke's gospel, uh, we get at the end of this, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on, descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice from heaven, uh, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So in Luke, we don't get John doing the baptism. I mean, we're not told that he doesn't, but Luke doesn't specifically and explicitly say that it's, that it's John. Uh, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that there's this clean break between the ministry of of John the Baptist, who was to prepare the way, and Jesus' baptism is the beginning of his earthly ministry. So John is now decreased fully, and Jesus has increased fully. 
So now the focus in the rest of Luke's gospel is going to be just on Jesus and not on John the Baptist. Uh, and that's what I'm, tr- I'm trying to get to get out there. Um, uh, and then interesting, we have, we're going to talk about this beginning next week, we're going to start with the, the genealogy of Jesus. And so in the other Gospels where you have the baptism of Christ and then he is immediately whisked away to be uh, tempted, um, that this does happen, but Luke will interject this genealogy between the two, between the baptism and the temptation of Jesus. And we're going to talk about next week why we think that that, that interjection probably happens. Uh, Any questions on finally after four weeks finishing chapter three? Uh, Because it would take too long to start getting into the genealogy, uh, we will stop here for the day because it's a good stop stopping point. If there are no questions, I have nothing else for you. Shall we close with the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, have a great week, everybody. I'll see most of you probably Wednesday.